started. All right, let's do this. So uh, today we want to learn about Ajax and pulling. Uh, but now that this is upon us, it's time to talk about, I mentioned this a few times in lecture because people ask, but let me just make sure everybody's up on uh, what's happening next week. Okay, so next week uh, we don't have any classes, uh, but I'll hold office hours in my office. Uh, I'll be in there uh, answering any questions you may have. Uh, I call this my um, let me let me make sure I'm looking right. Uh, so I do this because uh, like spring break, uh, spring semester, TAs can't be late. What the hell? <laughs> uh, so in the spring semester, we have that break right in the middle of the semester, and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it, spring semesters are just perfect because of that. Um, it's so nice having that break. It splits up the semester and everything. We don't have that in the fall semester, so at least... <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, so, uh, we don't have that in the spring, in the fall semester, so at least in my courses where I have control over this, I'm going to add that break and, and give us uh, what I call a, a fake fall break. That's what I call it, for what it's worth. So uh, we don't have any classes, and, uh, and 312 is just going to back off a bit. When I'm making the course schedule, I treat this as a void in the schedule. So when I'm planning out the semester and making the schedule, uh, I treat it as it doesn't exist. So where normally you would have homework to, oh man, did I mess this up? I got to think about this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's fine. So uh, we have three weeks of content, and then usually you have a week to work on the homework uh, without extra content, and then the following Monday is when the homework would be due. Like, that's the, the general flow of each homework. Uh, so you have three weeks of instruction, a week to do the homework, and then it's due. So I treat this as a week that doesn't exist in the schedule. So you tech kind of have an extra week for homework, too. And then homework two is not due till a week later, and then on Monday. So I don't expect you to. Uh, let me rephrase that. I don't require you to be working over the break. I, I, if you don't think about three twelve at all for a week, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, you can absolutely do that. Uh, if you want to come to office hours and work on the homework and, and start working on homework two, or finishing homework two, ideally, uh, absolutely you can do that too. So I know some of you will get caught up on things over that week. Uh, I know you have a lot of midterms and other semesters. Jeez, oh, I can't even think today. <laughs> it's getting worse each lecture. I got three back-to-back -back lectures, and but today, I don't know, my brain. Um, I know you have uh, midterms and other classes. This is when midterms are really heating up. It's right in the middle of the semester right now. So if you have one midterm, like you're going to have it somewhere around this uh, this spot. A lot of them would be next Friday. Like if I had a midterm, it would be right here. Uh, so I know you have a lot of midterms that you're going to be working on that. Even though 312 is backing off, your other courses are not. So they're going to be hitting you hard. Uh, but I do have a little ask, if you can pretty please do this for me. Uh, sometime over this break, probably on one of the weekends, if you can just take like a day to just chill and actually focus on your mental health and just get yourself in a good state. Uh, spring break's great for that. We have a week where we just chill. You don't think about school for a bit. You come back, um, I won't say refreshed, but at least not completely exhausted. In the fall semesters, by the time we get to right before, like the week before our Thanksgiving break, or our fall break, our actual fall break, we're all so exhausted. Myself, the TAs, all of you, we're all just so exhausted and burnt out by the time we get there that it's tough to close out the semester. We're all just looking forward to the break. Uh, so if you can, at least take one of those days and try to recharge a little bit. So going into the rest of the semester, you're not just absolutely destroying your mental health. That'd be, uh, that'd be awesome. Because um, the fall semester is just brutal. By the time we get to fall break, we're all fried. And then it takes all winter break to recover. Then we got to do it again in the spring. It's a, it's a, it's a brutal schedule. Uh, being in academia. Uh, so with that, let's talk about Ajax.
I'll try to get through these slides fairly quickly because I want to do a demo after this. What did I just do? Did I not wait for that to download? Download. If I just mentioned this in my last lecture, so it's on my mind. But if you're ever wondering why I download each set of slides, it says, like, this is your fifth copy of this slide deck. Uh, and I have all these slides downloaded. Uh, I always want to, when I start a lecture, start at the course website and show you that I'm presenting from the exact slides that you have access to on the course website. Uh, I had a lot of lectures where what's posted was different than, like, the professor made last minute changes and stuff. And what they're presenting from is different from what I had access to on the website. I don't like that, so I don't do that. Uh, so I always start from the course website to just absolutely verify, hey, I am using the same exact thing that I have posted. Uh, but with that, Ajax and polling. Let's talk about it. So we have our sites now uh, where users can interact with each other by the end of uh, Homework 2. And by the way, this isn't Homework 2 content, and Wednesday wasn't Homework 2 content. It is still in the three weeks for Homework 2, but on Monday, that's when I finished up everything you need for Homework 2. Uh, so I'm going to start setting up Homework 3 at this point. Uh, so after Homework 2, we have a way for users to interact with each other, but it does require a page load and a form submission. So you have to click Send on the form. That sends information. Your page reloads. But what about other people? Other people want to see your image with your caption. They want to see your, your messages and stuff. Uh, they're sitting there staring at the, your pay, at the page. But if you submit something with the form, they got to go up to that refresh button, hit refresh or F5, before they can see your content. Not exactly the functionality and the user experience that we want or expect from our apps. You wouldn't expect that from an app that you use these days. You would expect to see the posts uh, as, it, you know, as it comes, I guess depending on what site you're using. But especially if it's a chat app, uh, if I'm trying to interact with somebody live and share text-based information, have a conversation, I'm expecting their messages to pop up right away, as soon as they're sent. Uh, I, I hope you all agree with that. That's the feature we want from a lot of pages we visit. Yeah. Is that like what Twitter does with the likes? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar off the top of my head what exact mechanism Twitter uses for that. Uh, but they'll use one of the things that we're going to mention here. Uh, either polling, long polling, and eventually web sockets when we come back from the fake break. So we have this need to see new content without reloading the page. So if we want a chat app, I use this in lecture examples just because it's the, the easiest, you know, the, the most basic conceptual thing where we have a need like this. We have a chat app. We just want to see each other's messages. That's all we want. We just want to have a conversation online. We don't want to be refreshing the page, though. So what we need or what we, what we could have with the tools we have, I don't know. We're eventually going to use WebSocket, so I don't want to say we need this. Because uh, we're not actually going to implement AJAX in this class, unless you want to. You're, you're welcome to in some of the, uh, uh, when we get to homework four, there's design decisions that you can make. You can use WebSockets or AJAX. But uh, I don't require AJAX, I should say. But we, we want to make a get and post request. Get to get all the chat history and the new messages, and post to send new messages. We want to send these HTTP requests after the page loads, and ideally without refreshing the page. That's where AJAX is going to come in. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, that and XML is kind of just along for the ride at this point. Uh, but AJAX uh, calling, uh, making HTTP requests asynchronously. So with an AJAX request, we're going to write some JavaScript that's going to make an HTTP request, get the response, and then do whatever we want it to do with that response in our code and after the page loads without reloading the page again. Syntax for this, in our JavaScript, we're going to create a new XML HTTP request object. Again, that XML is just kind of along for the ride at this point. Uh, we've outgrown the XML side of things. But we're going to create a new AJAX request and we have a few things, a few methods that we can call on this, or I guess uh, a field that we can set and a method, two methods. Open, 
is going to take the HTTP method and path to send to. So for this, I want to make a git request to slash path. That's what open is going to do. It's going to set that method and path for me. And then send is actually going to fire off the request. So these are the, the three big pieces that we need. Create the request, set the method and path, and then send the request. If it's just a git request, this is all I, I need, is the, tell it it's a git request, specify the method, or sorry, specify the path, and fire it off. That's all I need, right? The rest of this, this on ready state change variable, which, is, which should be a, a function, which should be a callback function, is going to be a function that's called whenever the ready state changes. So whenever the state of this, this request changes from, okay, it's sent, I'm gonna start receiving data, but I'll be in a buffering state. Uh, there are different states which are represented by integers, and the one that we're interested in is four. So when the ready state changes, and it changes to four, which is uh, this magic number in this library, which says this is the ready state for a completed response. All right, the response came in, we read the content length, we've read that many bytes from the body, like we have everything ready for you. It's completely ready, that's what our for means. And then I'm also going to check the status code. Uh, this isn't strictly required, but I'm gonna make sure that I got a 200 response. It's, it's, it's something you should do. I'm gonna make sure that I got a 200 level, uh, 200 response. That's our okay response, everything's good. Everything's good uh, with your response and your request. And this is the information that you requested. Uh, so for example, if I send off an AJAX request and I get a 404, I don't wanna run all my code to be able to handle the response when the response was a 404. So I'm only going to handle it when it's a 200 response. Yeah. Is this all on the server side? This is all client side. Uh, yeah, I should have specified that. This is all client side. That's why we're, that's why I'm showing JavaScript without saying, okay, I'll show you JavaScript and Python or anything. This is all JavaScript because it's all client side. Okay. Have to do this in JavaScript. And then the first request that the browser uh, sends to the server and the, then the server returns the JavaScript, that would be what the server returns under JavaScript? Mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah, so this code would be in the JavaScript. So you request, so to fill it into the big picture, uh, the clients go into our site, it's gonna, create a TCP connection with our server, say, give me your HTML. We send the HTML, the HTML says, you also need this JavaScript and other things. Okay, you request the JavaScript, download it. The JavaScript will contain some code that looks like this that fires off AJAX requests, and then the site's going to fire off AJAX requests and get the responses after the page loads. It's gonna continue to fire off HTTP requests. And then once this is the case, the ready state changed, we're done buffering, we read the whole thing, we got a 200 response, then it's do what you do. Whatever you need to do with that response or whatever you wanna do with that response, if you're making a request for the chat history, you're gonna render that to the page and uh, add all that content wherever you need to add it with whatever formatting you want. Uh, you would add that with your JavaScript uh, inside here. Of course, I'm just logging it to the console because it's just a, a lecture example. Uh, but this is where you would do whatever you're gonna do with it. You wanna make a post request, same thing, you gotta change the path to post, but now when you call send, it's gonna take an argument, and that argument is going to be whatever the body of the request should be. And the browser's gonna take care of your MIME types and content length and all that stuff for you. Just send it, uh, just send a string, and the browser's gonna handle everything else from there. This is gonna send a post request to slash path with this as a JSON string to my server. Uh, so in, in this example, this would be like, I, I typed in welcome to the chat, and then I'm gonna send that to the server so the server can let everyone know that I, I welcomed them. Okay. 
Okay, so we're making HTTP requests after the page loads. Yeah, go us. Uh, why do we want to do this? So a few of these, a few of the motivation I alluded to earlier. Um, but we also see this. You see this every day, every, um, pretty much every time you visit a modern website. You're going to see this. You go to a website, the page loads, but there's like nothing there. And then slowly all the content starts filling in. You see this constantly. Uh, so you're requesting the HTML. The HTML comes back, but it's just like a skeleton of the page. And that loads really fast. One thing we like for user experience online is that the page loads really fast. So for that initial page load, we're just sending HTML. And that's what you see like as fast as that HTML can get to you. Uh, that's what's going to load. And then after the HTML loads, a whole bunch of AJAX calls are fired off. And as the AJAX calls start coming back, that's where all the content is going to start coming from. And then the JavaScript is going to read that content and render it to the page. All that rendering is happening in JavaScript now. Uh, and the reason for this, if we just loaded all the content, so, so in homework two, you're generating HTML using HTML templates. You're rendering them server side and then sending them to the client. Uh, we're going to start talking about, uh, starting on this slide, we're going to start talking about an alternative way to do that, to render HTML, and that's by doing it client side. So suppose that we did do this server side and we had a few database lookups, maybe a few expensive joins to make, and we have this algorithm that's going to decide what content to show you. Somebody, a user is going to their news feed. We go to the database, pull up this user's profile, their history of everything they've ever done on the internet, throw that in our algorithm. The algorithm spits out, oh, this person should be shown these posts. And then we render that to the page and then fire it off to the user and say, here's your home page. Uh, by the time all that happens, the user might be gone. Like, this site's broken. They'll click refresh eight times and then be like, ah, I'm leaving. Because uh, it's going to take you know, maybe half a second. But it's going to take a little bit to load. We have short attention spans these days. It's just a part of life now. Um, so instead, we send the HTML right away. And that hopefully gets there in less than a tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds or so. And then the AJAX requests are making the calls that are going to do the expensive database operations, the algorithms that need to decide what content to show you, uh, what ads to show you, unfortunately. Uh, all that's really expensive. And that comes back as each AJAX call comes back. Then that content is slowly populating. So when you go to a page, the page loads, and then the content shows up. Uh, and we also want a better user experience. Why, to make, why I make AJAX calls? Why I make calls after the page loads? Uh, better features. Um, if we are interacting, if we're just taking page loads and not making AJAX calls or any way of contacting the server after the page loads, whatever you get, whatever the page loads as, like, that's it. That's what you're seeing. That's the content until you refresh. So if we have a way to access the server, access data on the server, and send data to the server after the page loads, it gives us more features that we can build. So instead of reloading the page, which uh, we could have the page reload like constantly. We could just write some JavaScript that says reload the page like every second. Uh, we could do that, but we might see flickering. There might be some really awkward user experience. If they're trying to type in a form, their inputs are constantly being eaten as the form reloads with no content on it. Um, then we write extra JavaScript to save their content, and I don't, it, it, it gets messy. Um, and the extra bandwidth for that is no good. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just pretty limited on what we can do. I, I can just read the next two bullet points. But like, how are you going to stream content? How are you going to stream a video if whatever you get when it loads? Well, actually, you could do that. Uh, you'd have to host the entire video, send the entire video all in one go, and then view it. And I guess you could do that, but it's not how streaming works. Uh, and you can do live streaming with that. If you want to watch a live stream, how does that even work if you're not talking to the server after page load? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So we, want, uh, so we want a way to be able to communicate to the server after it loads. So how are we going to set these 
uh, set up these J, uh, AJAX requests. We can do it with the forms that we've already had. I don't recommend this way, but I want to show you that we can do it the same way in case you want to do it like this. Um, but we can set up the form to do the same thing. We're going to set up the form almost identical to how we had it, except we're not going to specify a method because we're not going to use the form itself to send requests. Instead, I'm going to click, uh, set this on submit. So when somebody clicks the submit button, I'm going to override what that button does by default and replace it with a call to a method that I'll write, the send message with form, which we'll see on the next slide. I'll have this method be called, a oh, function at this point, this function be called, and then I'm going to do return false, which says, hey, whatever else you were going to do, don't do that. Just do my thing. So now the page isn't going to reload. I'm overriding that page reload that would happen when I submit the form that usually happens, and I'm just calling send message with form when this form is submitted. Does this course cover streaming video? I have in the past, but uh, I mean, I, I can during review week by request, but uh, by default, I won't really cover it. I can, I'll talk about it, but uh, I won't go into it in depth like I used to. Uh, it's just, it's so much work for, like, it's cool, but it's so much work for not too much payoff. Uh, and having you do it on an assignment can, it gets daunting. So then my send message with form, this function that's going to be called when the, uh, when the form is submitted. I'm going to get my form element. So I gave my form an ID of my form. In this example, I'm going to get my form element and then create a new form data object with that element as an argument. That's going to give me all of the data from the form and if I just straight up send that form data, that's going to give me a post request in the same format that I would if I submitted the form regularly. Uh, the difference here is that there's no page load when I make this submission. So now I'm going to send all the form data. In this case, the form was multi-part form data encoded. So I'm going to get my text message as a multi-part form request, just like the form we use in homework two. It would be that same format, except I'm going to send it as an AJAX request instead of a regular request. So we can use that, all that multi-part form parsing code that you've hopefully already written, though I'm not that optimistic. Uh, most of you probably haven't started that yet. But, uh, but all that code that you have written or will write, you could reuse that by setting up your forms this way, just grabbing the form data and then sending it in an AJAX request. I said I don't really recommend that. Uh, we can get away, if we, once we start using AJAX and eventually WebSockets, we can get away from forms entirely and build our own forms. Um, I shouldn't say get away from forms, but get away from the form element type in HTTP and just create our own forms, however, with our, whatever format that we want. So here, I'm going to have my form element, uh, my input still, with my label, uh, just without the form surrounding it and then create a regular old button that's going to call a send message method, send message function, that's going to read the value of my message and then send it to the server in whatever format I choose. So in send message, I'm going to grab my chat element, read its value. The dot value is whatever the user typed in to that chat box. I'm going to create my AJAX request and then send that data in whatever format I choose. I have full control now over the information that I'm reading, and I can send it in whatever format I want. This is a web thing in a web class, so I like JSON. Uh, that's just how we like to communicate information over the internet. JSON as a format has really taken over, so why not JSON? Through this multi part form data stuff, I'm just going to send JSON encoded as UTF 8. Why not? It can represent like just about anything. And with a little work, it could represent any information that we want. Even images, interestingly enough, uh, with, some, with uh, base 64 encoding. But, uh, uh, but we can send this in any format that we want. 
So after homework two, you don't want to touch multi-part form parsing anymore because you wrote some really crappy code and didn't write generic code, which a lot of you do. Uh, in homework three, when you have your choice of how to build your forms and what format to send things in, you can read the form elements one at a time, read the information that the user inputted, and send it in whatever format, probably JSON strings, that you want. Or, or CSVs. I, I, hey, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Does that basically read whatever's currently in the um, chat input div, um, package it into a JSON object, and then send that? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, except it's not a div, it's a text input. So this will be a text box uh, with ID chat input. So I'm reading that element and then getting its value, which will be whatever the user typed in. And that's also client side. That's this is all client side. I'm all client side today. Yeah, today, uh, Wednesday, and uh, part of Monday, all client side. What have you found for AJAX requests besides live chat? Like, just about everything. Uh, so much is, like, uh, go, to your, go to your console, your web console in your browser, go to the network tab, and go to, like, any page. And then notice how many requests come after the page loads. Like, after you can see something in your browser window, look at how many requests are still fired off. It's all AJAX. Well, actually, I shouldn't say it's all AJAX. Um, but whenever you see X, X, XHR, I think it is, uh, whenever you see that as the type, it's an AJAX request. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How are you going to get new ads when the first ones are gone? Yeah, any new content that loads after the page loads, it's all AJAX. Okay. So I, I uh, led into this conversation a little early, but... Let's talk about rendering content. So we have two choices now of when to render content. For homework two, I say you have to render content on the server, and that's it. That's your only choice. Um, but that's actually pretty limiting and doesn't really happen often with modern apps. Like we, we don't really do that anymore. Uh, so let's talk about that. When do we render content? So right now, we're rendering HTML templates server side. So what we do is read this partial HTML, this HTML template. We grab the data that we want to populate it with. We render it, which means jam the data into the HTML, and then send that completed HTML off to the user. Uh, that's the way we do it in homework, too. And it's fine if you do that the rest of the semester. The, you, this is a design decision that you can make uh, in future homeworks. So one downside to this is we're using our CPU, You're using server CPU. If you've got a million users, you know, whatever CPU that takes to render a template, multiply that by a million, uh, and you know, that can add up. Maybe that's an acceptable cost. Uh, maybe that's what you want to do. But it's something that needs to be considered, that that CPU that's going to be used, the CPU time, is your server CPU time when we're rendering like this. Uh, it also leads to much slower page loads. Like how I mentioned, you get the HTML, and then it renders. Uh, we can't do that because we're finalizing the HTML and then sending the whole thing in one go with the HTML with the data already in it. And what if you want a mobile app? I don't talk about mobile really at all in this course, uh, but what if you want a mobile app, except right now? You build this website, you, you're, you build your server. It, its whole purpose is to serve completed HTML to the user, and somebody wants a, a native mobile app. What do you even do besides rebuild your whole thing? Like your, your templating engine, all, anything that works with that, uh, you got to rebuild that if you want a native mobile app. You really can't reuse your endpoints that you have if your endpoints are serving HTML and your apps don't speak HTML. Uh, you can. There are ways to do it, but that's how, uh, that's how all our RAM disappears because developers do that way too much. Just take their websites and package them as native apps. How we stop mobile development strangling everything? I'm not sure I understand the question so much. Um, 
don't develop mobile apps. <laughs> so I, personally, I don't understand mobile apps <laughs> at all. I don't know. I, I, I might be... It might be an unpopular opinion, but I don't understand mobile apps. Like, just take your phone, which has a browser, and go to the web app. I, web apps are, are made so uh, mobile-friendly these days. Like, just go to the web app. Uh, there are very few apps that I actually use. And uh, I don't know. But, but people demand it, so you got to build them. But... Uh, I, I don't get the craze. There's only a few actual apps that I use. Everything else, I just go to the websites. Yeah? Instead of updating the site live when people post stuff, would there be a way to kind of have it reload the site at like every half second? Yes. Is that like an alternative, or is that the same? Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about that by the time we get to the end of the lecture. Uh, it's called polling. All right, so now we have an alternative. Instead of our server serving the final HTML, our server's going to send, well, the HTML template still. We can't really get around that if we want to be a web app. But we're going to serve the HTML template effectively and then have endpoints that serve raw data, usually as JSON. So if our web server, if most of it is just an API that's serving data, then we can have the user request the HTML, get some bare-bones skeleton HTML, and then hit the API endpoints to say, OK, now I need my news feed. Now I need my DMs and notifications. Now I need my ads. And send all these AJAX requests for these different API endpoints that are all serving different content. I get all this JSON back. And then the JavaScript on the front end renders that JSON into HTML and displays it on the page for the user. And this is how your front-end frameworks are going to work. If you're building a React app, React is that's like the core of what that's doing, is uh, having all the, the uh, skeletons for uh, all the templates for the HTML uh, in your JavaScript, and then rendering the content based on API calls that are serving data. Uh, that's, uh, that's the core of how that's, uh, that's going. Uh, Advantages and disadvantages, one, I, depending on how you see it and what your app is, you are using the user's CPU. You can see this as an advantage or a disadvantage. One, it's going to chew up your user's CPU. It's going to cost more for, for your users to visit your site, but maybe not noticeably much more, especially since every site does this. I don't think anybody really cares that much. Uh, so that's less cost for your servers. Your servers don't have to do as much computation. Uh, and it'll decrease increase, I should say decrease load times here, because you're getting the initial page faster, but uh, in most cases, your client's machines are going to be slower than your servers, so it will take longer to render is what I mean by that bullet point, but I should reword that one. Um, so they might end up at the final content a little bit later than they would have, but they'll see some content much sooner. And with much, like I'm talking the span of maybe a full second. Like you know how long a page loads. Like we're not talking huge amounts of time, uh, but enough to matter. If a page loads in 900 milliseconds versus 700 milliseconds, like that's a noticeable difference. Now, now if your server's main goal is to just have these API endpoints that serve JSON data, just raw data, and you want to build that mobile app, no big deal. I mean, you still got to do some work to build uh, basically the HTML templates, but in your uh, phone's native environment, you still got to build that. But then you're just going to hit the endpoints end the same way you did before, and then figure out how to render that data in, the native, uh, in that phone's native stuff. So when you go to a new app, a new platform, what you're building is just the front end. How do I display things on this device? If I want to build a Roku app, how do I build things on that device? Just the front end. If I'm building uh, an Xbox app, how do I build for the front end for this specific device? But I'm not changing anything on the back end. I'm still just hitting the same endpoints. Uh, so I, I think of Netflix with this all the time, because Netflix has apps on like everything. They have an app on everything. They didn't build actual completely new apps for every single device, every single platform that they target. 
what they do is have their API be able to serve content. Here's all the content. Here's the list of movies for this user. Uh, here's this actual movie, the bytes for this actual movie that I can send. And it's just going to be endpoints serving raw data. And then for each platform they target, they're just going to build a new front end. So they're going to recreate that front end in a lot of different languages for a lot of different platforms. But they're not rewriting Netflix for, uh, for PS5. Like They're not rewriting the entire thing. They're just making a new front end with whatever's native to that new environment. Just the look and feel, the, the Netflix interface that we're used to, because they do a good job of recreating it in all these different environments. But then that interface is connecting to the same APIs that are just serving data. There's just one Netflix server. Well, I shouldn't say one, because it's, it's a distributed system. But there's the Netflix server code that they just write once, and it works for all of these platforms. OK. so. We don't need page loads. That's fine, I guess. But we still have a problem here is I go to the page. I'm chatting. This is fun. I chat. Uh, it sends something. I can click a button to send an AJAX request to get the new messages. But what if somebody sends a message and I don't actively fire off an AJAX request? Because I don't want to do that. Even though I'm not hitting refresh, you know, I'm just hitting this button that says fire off an AJAX request to get the new chats. Uh, I still don't want to do that. So we want it to be actually live so we can have interaction without any action being taken, required to be taken by the users. You want to just be able to sit there. Maybe two people are chatting, and you just want to watch. I just want to sit there and watch. I want my users to have that ability. So this is where polling comes in. Polling, the concept is actually pretty simple. We're just going to write some JavaScript code, typically just one line of JavaScript code that just keeps firing off AJAX requests. That's it. It's polling. So I'm going to use this set interval function that's built into JavaScript. I'm going to write my get messages function, which I don't have on these slides, but it'll fire off the AJAX requests to get all the chat history and then render it to the screen. Uh, and I'm going to call set interval, which is going to call my function every so many milliseconds. In this case, every second, I'm going to fire off an AJAX request to get new messages. So every second, fire off an AJAX request, get a response, render it to the page. Fire off an AJAX request, get a response, send, render it to the page. Now the user doesn't have to do anything to get the new messages. My JavaScript's just continuously firing off AJAX requests. Pretty simple. One line of code, done. Uh, this has pretty bad limitations, though. Generally, we don't want to use polling. Uh, one, whatever the interval is, so we can adjust this interval. But whatever that interval is, we have this trade off between how long users have to wait for new content. You just have to wait up to a full second for new content here, which for a chat app, whatever, it's fine. But what if I have a, a PvP game where two people are moving around in the game world? And they're trying to interact with each other in that way. I'm not playing a first person shooter where I got to wait a second to see where my opponent is at this point. Uh, that's unplayable. So uh, either they got to wait a long time or we decrease that number and we're increasing server load and using up a lot of bandwidth. Uh, neither one of these are, it's not a good trade off to be making. Either, both of those are pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so long pulling to the rescue. Long polling, um, I don't expect any of you to do in this class. Uh, but I want to talk about it because you will see it out there. So with long polling, it's kind of like polling, except you have a much longer interval, usually like 15 to 25 seconds, for, poll request, for polling requests. But when you fire off a request with long polling, the server will you know, respond with any new information. But if the server doesn't have new information for you, the server will just hang. It'll just sit there and say, hey, I hear your HTTP request. I got it sitting here. And I'm just going to let it sit here. And I'm not going to send a response. And then something happens where the server has new information. Maybe this person over here sent a chat message. Then immediately the server goes, hey, I got something new. Respond to that request. So you get to know about that new information immediately. Well, minus network delays. And then I respond. And then you send a new request. So uh, 
if this times out, maybe I wait like 15 seconds and say, hey, I got nothing new for you, try again. And then the client tries again right away. So the goal is that every client that's connected always has a request that's just sitting there waiting for the server to respond. And then when the server has something new, it's going to respond to those requests, and then the clients will send new requests. So you always have each client just sitting there waiting for a response. That's the idea with long polling. Uh, this gives us, much, uh, gives us pretty much live interactions. You're going to see those chat messages immediately. Uh, for what it's worth, Facebook chat still uses long polling. Uh, so this is something you might see out there in the world. And uh, uh, so you always have a request sitting there, so you can get immediate responses from the server. Our actual solution, the one I will require you to implement, is WebSockets, because WebSockets are awesome. Uh, one big advantage with long polling, which is getting less and less relevant uh, each day, is that it's compatible with really old browsers. That if somebody has an outdated browser version that existed before WebSockets existed, they can uh, they can still use a long polling site because long polling is just built on HTTP. It doesn't require a brand new protocol to use. Uh, so there is an advantage there, but it is still used out there. If you work at Facebook, you're probably going to be messing with long polling at some point. Yeah. Uh, with something like that, you, I, I think I, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what they use. But my guess is they would have to use something like WebSockets, but they probably have their own protocols, is what I would guess. That you connect to their server on some, you know, whatever port that game uses. Like uh, when you play a game like that, sometimes you have to get into your router and do port forwarding. Like, that's the port that that game runs on, and then it'll speak its own protocol on that port uh, it, without using any web technologies, is I'm pretty sure how, how those games work. Yeah, because if the internet goes down, you, you, keep, you see your opponents, like, redo the same move over and over again. Oh, yeah, that's, that's different. That's something else, too. Uh, so there are all kinds of prediction algorithms to predict where your opponents are. And that's that prediction algorithm going over and over. There's some fancy stuff with that, because... Because there's always lag in a game, like always. You're going to have at least uh, a couple hundred milliseconds of lag uh, just in network times. So games like that have all kinds of really cool stuff to try to smooth that out. And you can always see the artifacts of it. Like if you play long enough, you'll see the really strange behavior. A player goes over here and then frickin' sprints over here. Like that's the prediction algorithm failing. Somebody took an unexpected move that the prediction algorithm couldn't do and had a lag spike at the same time. Then you're going to see them flying over there. Uh, PyCharm. OK, something I want to talk about for homework two. I get these questions a lot, so I want to make sure I demo this before homework two content's over, is uh, breaking images. So I have this image, which you've all seen of a cat. It's a legit image. It works. And all I want to do is simulate an HTTP request and save this image. So I'm going to create an HTTP request. I'm going to set my content length to the right part. I'm not actually going to parse the, the HTTP properly or anything. And I'm going to append the bytes. I'm reading in bytes. And append the image to the end of the bytes, just like you served an image in homework one. Uh, basically, homework one, uh, objective three code. And then I'm going to parse that request. I'm going to parse it in a very crappy way, a very poor way. Bad. I'm going to start with this one. The very first thing I'm going to do is what a lot of you do, which works for homework one just fine. But for homework two, this is going to start causing trouble. And it has, uh, we've been getting office hour questions about this. Very first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to get this request and split it on my new lines, split it on my CRLFs. And I'm going to parse this thing as usual. The request line is the first line. Splits of zero, that's fine. Read in headers. I'm just going to go through my splits. I'm going to delete a split. I don't know why I did this so weird. I was looking at this code today, reviewing it. I'm like, why did I write it like this? But I'm going to go through my splits. And as long as it's not a blank line, then I know I'm reading headers. Once I reach a blank line, 
then I know the rest is my content. I'm going to read that content and then save that image to output.jpg, save the image, and then I'm going to print out the size of the image that I just saved. Who thinks this code is going to work? So I should have my cat here. Oh, frick, I don't. The, the Python script called break an image, broke an image. <laughs> so if I look through here, I see the content length I get was 40, 43,000-ish, 44,000 ish. But the bytes that I saved, I only saved 2,600 bytes. What went wrong here? Exactly. So let's change this. Let me demo this. Let's parse this in a good way. I'm going to run this. My output is a cat. Everything worked great for this one. Let's look at the code for parsing this in a good way. Oh, let me explain what the problem was first, actually. So the problem is right here, this line right here. I'm splitting on slash r slash n. And then just saying, whatever's after that blank line, the, the next split, that's my image, right? The problem is my image contains these new line characters. But new lines aren't in images. What the crap? Uh, that's, that's how the office hour inter interactions go. There's no new line character in an image because an image isn't a string. I've said that a billion times in here. How the hell am I going to have a slash r slash n in something that's not a string? Uh, absolutely valid uh, analysis of what's going on. Uh, so I'm going to split this in a good way. I'm just going to look for the first instance of this delimiter, and then I'm going to split based on that first instance. I'm not going to say dot .split. A lot of you do dot .split and then give it a second argument, which is the, the you know, stop after this many splits, which is perfectly fine. Uh, I like, I've found the index here and then manually split at that index, took everything before the first CRLF, CRLF, as my headers and everything after as my image. Saved my image. I saved this many bytes. That's the, exactly the same as that content length. But let's look at why uh, this actually happened. So I'm printing. I have this function that I wrote that will print values as binary, and I'm going to add leading zeros uh, to make sure that it's formatted nice. I'm going to print slash r slash n in binary. There's a lot of bytes to the image. Where's my sidebar? Get out of here. I don't care. So my slash r slash n in binary using ASCII encoding is going to be these two bytes. There's not actually a slash r slash n. Like that's how we interpret it because we're interpreting these two bytes as ASCII values or as UTF-8 values. But in reality, they're just two bytes. There's nothing special about them. It's just a sequence of 16 ones and zeros. That's what my slash r slash n is. That's all it is. Over here, I print out all the bytes of that image of the cat. I'm going to find these bytes. And right there in the middle of my image are those same two bytes. Like it's, a, it's an image, but images are allowed to use those two bytes. And sometimes they'll just happen to appear next to each other. It's perfectly valid. It's a perfectly valid image, but it just happens to contain a, what we are looking, what we're splitting on as a slash r slash n. It happens to contain those same bytes inside the image. And I'm out of time, but I'll, I'll just mention I, I don't get to I don't get to break goose today. Uh, but even when we're splitting on slash r slash n slash r slash n, even that can appear in your image file. It's Valid sequence of bytes, it might happen in your image. And when we're testing, we just might test with images that we know contain slash r slash n slash r slash n as a byte sequence. Just these two bytes twice. It's perfectly valid for an image. Images can do that. They're allowed to do that. It's not a string, but using ASCII encoding, the bytes just happen to be the same byte sequence that can appear in anything. It could be a PDF. It could be 
an image, it could be a movie. That byte sequence is allowed in other things, not just strings. Uh, so with that, have a great week, and I'll see you the following Monday.